tonight on CBC Vancouver News. You wish you could have done something better for them. It's, it's a difficult uh, feeling. Scrambling to get their loved ones to safety. Afghan Canadians in B.C. react to carnage also. It shouldn't be on the planner. It shouldn't be on the couple either. Switching gears and making changes. How B.C.'s brides and grooms are adapting to new COVID rules quickly and... Very unusual. It's uh, strange and certainly puzzling. $12,000 worth of stolen gold teeth. The mystery and why police need your help. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Dozens of people are dead and more than 100 others badly hurt in two bombings outside Kabul's airport. At least 60 Afghans and 13 U.S. service members have been killed. It's a major escalation of the chaos already gripping a country at the center of an international crisis. Let me be clear, while we're saddened by the loss of life, both U.S. and Afghan, we're continuing to execute the mission. Our mission is to evacuate U.S. citizens, third country nationals, special immigrant visa holders, U.S. Embassy staff and Afghans at risk. One blast shook the area around a crowded gate into the airport during a massive evacuation effort. Another explosion went off close to a nearby hotel where Western officials have reportedly been staying. The blasts follow warnings from the U.S. of threats from an ISIS affiliate. Canada's Defence Department says Canadian Forces members in Kabul are safe and accounted for. No word yet on whether any Canadian civilians are among the casualties. Uh, the blasts came after what the Canadian government now says was the final evacuation flight out of the country. And as Susanna De Silva reports, it is news that has left many Afghan British Columbians frustrated and scrambling to help loved ones. I am shaking. Every, every day, every moment, fearing that somebody will, the Taliban will capture my family member and they will, they will, they will kill them. Shaquille Zarine arrived in Canada three years ago after surviving a horrific attack in Afghanistan. Her family was powerless to stop her forced marriage to a member of the Taliban. He shot her in the face for going to police about his abuse. She has been outspoken about the Taliban and through a friend speaks of what she fears that means for her family. My speeches against the Taliban, my condemnation of the Taliban publicly put them in grave danger right now. They are in hiding and uh, they are stuck uh, in Afghanistan right now. She says she applied through Canada's program announced to bring up to 20,000 refugees to Canada. I have contacted the Canadian government regarding, regarding my family's application to come here. Nobody answered. And frustration today at the news Canada has suspended evacuation flights out of the country, citing safety concerns. So far, 3,700 people have been rescued. This is the most difficult two weeks of my life. Hakim Nazim left Afghanistan the last time the Taliban came to power. He has several siblings still there and is a member of the Afghan Canadian Association of BC. Probably I have responded to more than 15 or 1600 messages, phone calls, WhatsApp, social media. It's the worst part of it that you, your hands are tight here. Yeah. It's very little that we can do from here, but the expectation is the other way around. He was devastated to see the carnage in today's bombings and frustrated at what he says is Canada's lack of action. I am disappointed, I am mad and I am very sad that the Canadian government is not accepting any responsibility and they are just saying we did our best. No, they did not did their best. A group of Canadian lawyers is calling on the Canadian government to take several steps including resuming flights and broadening the criteria for those eligible to come. What we need is innovation. We need speed and we need heart and we need to make sure that the principles of human rights are upheld in Afghanistan. But Zareen worries time is running out for her family. Helpless to risk uh, to rescue my family. This feeling that I'm having now and what I'm going through is worse than what I was going through in Afghanistan. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. And we'll have much more coverage of the devastation in Afghanistan coming up later in the show.
COVID-19 cases in B.C. have climbed, surpassing 700. Two more people have died as well. And today, more data from the province about who is getting the virus. This past week, 71% of positive cases are among unvaccinated people. 11.5% of cases among people who have had just one dose of the vaccine. And those who are fully vaccinated account for 17% of cases. Vaccination numbers, though, continue to rise after the announcement of B.C.'s vaccine passport. More than 9,000 people got a shot yesterday. That's up more than 1,000 from the day before. I was working in the woods tree planting all summer, so I didn't really need it. And I'm out now, so yeah, I kind of need it. A lot of government regulations around it. So I want to travel. It's kind of just like what you have to do now. I didn't want to get it in the first place, but now it's, you know, everything changing. Vaccine registrations and bookings have jumped up more than 200% this week. And with a new mask mandate and a vaccine passport coming in soon, brides and grooms here in B.C. are being forced to quickly adapt their weddings. And as Benit Brach reports, they're looking for more answers so they can safely accommodate their guests. With a wedding gig just a few weeks away, coordinator Brianne Dodge has more questions than answers. Whose responsibility does it fall on to to make sure that the mandated vaccine um, is being checked with all the guests. BC's Ministry of Health says the wedding industry will know more by September 13th, but that's the actual date the vaccine card comes into play. I need to not only understand what's expected of me as a coordinator, but also communicate with other vendors and the venues um, for what's expected of them. For now, a lack of direction has Dodge perfecting a backup plan. A welcome table, essentially, and checking every guest as they came through. But that also means more staff and training expenses. Not ideal for her or her clients, she says. Other wedding vendors say the industry is already overworked with changes on short notice. It shouldn't be on the planner. It shouldn't be on the couple either. Um, yeah. it, there needs to be some autonomy there. While the industry waits for specifics to put safety first, vendors and couples are staying hopeful through the mandates. As a company, anything we can do to get back to normal life is a step in the right direction. So we're going to take all the necessary precautions to make sure that that happens. When this bride and groom found out about the return of masks indoors, she scoured to find a tent to host a reception outdoors this weekend. We don't want to have an event that people are not comfortable being at. We would rather not have it. This bride and groom had to postpone their events last year, hoping 2022 will bring a maskless reception, uniting their American and Canadian families for the first time. Right now, I'm just crossing my fingers that it's just not going to be as bad yeah. when our wedding occurs. So I can't even put myself in that headspace. <laughs> but one thing the pandemic has made clear is that the future is anything but predictable. Benit Breach, CBC News, Abbotsford. Well, Granville Island is a bit busier with tourists these days. It says its daytime visitors have doubled since the start of BC's restart plan. We were on a plane for the first time during the uh, since the pandemic. Feels like feels like they're happy to see us back. I guess I don't know. <laughs> I'm excited to finally be done with online school <laughs> and be able to come here. Yeah. On a weekend in late spring, around 450 shoppers went through the public market by end of day, but now as many as 1,200 people daily. Anecdotally, Granville Island says the increase is because of travelers from Alberta, Quebec and the U.S., but it's still operating at below capacity. Usually allowed 1,800 people at a given time, but that allowance is at 70 percent on weekdays and 40 percent on weekends. Well, at election time, voters of South Asian descent play a pivotal role in several ridings in B.C. and Ontario. In recent decades, the community has managed to turn its grassroots activism into political clout and even put some India-specific issues on the table. Although, as Bell Peary reports, it remains uncertain how they may influence the election. Suki turned to Min Jun and yelled, I think she's strange. Sandeep Sodhi's book is a multicultural cast of characters, just like her classroom. 
when I read aloud to the children, they love it when the, I, they can hear an ethnic name. Sodi was a child herself when she and her Indian-born parents immigrated here from England. I remember very, you know, strongly that my father used to say we have to, you know, vote for who was able to bring me to this country, which political party. Good evening, friends. Welcome to Nigga. Welcome to program Evening News Show. The federal election is also top of mind at this daily Punjabi news program. There was a time when it was very important to have our symbolic representation in the BC ledge, in the parliament, in the city halls. But now things have changed because almost all parties are giving representation to South Asian communities, especially in the ridings with sizable population of South Asians. For example, in BC, it's not unusual to see ridings where all major party candidates are of Punjabi heritage. So then people start raising hard questions. Those questions are largely in line with mainstream issues like housing, health care and the economy, but others are community specific. Take the Indian community, for example. Indian issues continue to cross the oceans and land here. And Pockets of the community are actively engaged in the plight of Indian farmers opposed to agricultural reform in that country. There's also a push to lift the ban on direct flights from India and for family reunification. Historically, the immigrant South Asian community has been politically aware for decades. It was previous generations here in B.C. who fought for years to actually win the right to vote in 1947. And since then, its political savvy has been continually evolving. The second generation kids who've never gone to their home country and are born here, have lived here, have settled here, their ideas are also evolving. And I think they will shape how we look at politics as well. It's happening already. I have empathy for what's happening in India. I have empathy for what's happening in other parts of the world. But that should not justify how I'm voting for my leader here in Canada. So far, none of the major party platforms mention anything about India-specific issues, but the leaders have all spoken in support of Indian farmers. Bell Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, supporters of embattled Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou gathered online today to mark the 1,000th day of her detainment. Well, against Canadian democracy and, and civil liberties, because if it can happen to Meng Wanzhou, it can happen to anybody. It's been 1,000 days since the Canadian government apprehended Meng at the request of former U.S. President Donald Trump. Her supporters are calling on the government to release her. The final decision on whether to render Meng to the United States is expected in the coming months. Firefighters across B.C. are getting some reprieve with a drop in temperatures. There are now 22 wildfires of note burning in the province. It's nearly half the number at the peak of this season. Crews are already taking advantage of the change in weather. We're getting a closer look here of this controlled ignition south of the aggressive White Rock Lake fire. Firefighters trying to rob it of fuel before flames arrive in the area. Two other major interior fires are no longer classified as out of control. Wildfire officials expect the favorable weather conditions to continue for the next week or so, saying some evacuees will also be allowed to return home in the coming days and weeks. And Johanna is off this week. Amy Bell joins us now with the forecast. So is that the case? We are going to be seeing that reprieve? Yeah, we are. Things are definitely very calm in the forecast. Cooler temperatures, which is the biggest help. And then today we did have some precipitation. Not a lot, but enough to uh, just further drive that temperature down and keep the air nice and moist. Well, as you can see, we're looking at a lot of sort of a low to moderate uh, danger rating for the wildfire. So certainly a much better scenario than we were seeing even just a week ago. So we'll continue to monitor that, but definitely... Uh, we will be returning to some sunshine in the next coming days. So again, things will start to dry out a little bit. Taking a look at today, we did have a lot of active weather around Prince George, uh, very intense uh, showers at times and even a few strikes of lightning. For the most part, though, it was just passing showers in many areas. They could be intense for a few minutes at a time, but a lot of just mist and drizzle as we saw this system moving in from the north coast and then gradually creeping right across the province. We will continue to see that trend in the overnight hours and then early tomorrow morning we could still see a few showers in many areas and a bit of unsettled weather right around Cranbrook tomorrow that we're going to keep an eye on as there is a risk of thunder and lightning. For us locally we will see a chance of early morning showers as I mentioned and then brightening right up to sunshine and a high around 20 degrees. A bit warmer with a mix of sun and cloud for Saturday and lots of sunshine and very warm with temperatures in the low to mid 20s on Sunday. So enjoy. All right. Thanks Amy. You're welcome.
Two more people have come forward to report a man exposing himself in Coquitlam near Eagle Ridge Drive. Now police are asking for your help finding the suspect they believe is behind three incidents. He's described as a South Asian or Middle Eastern man in his mid-40s. He's 5 foot 10 inches tall with a medium build and a medium skin tone, short black hair and stubble. Police have released two composite sketches. He was last seen in a black ball cap, orange raincoat and a white shirt and blue shorts. Anyone with information is asked to contact Coquitlam RCMP. Well, it's a bizarre case from Vancouver police today. Thousands of dollars worth of stolen dental gold in East Vancouver. This is uh, a very uh, strange and puzzling case. It's unlike anything I've ever uh, seen or heard about here. And uh, it's not something we come across uh, on a regular basis. It's $12,000 worth of dental gold used for caps, fillings and bridges removed from people's mouths. These are commonly collected from dental offices and resold to buyers. Police don't know where the gold was taken from or who owns it, but they believe it was stolen during a break and enter, possibly from outside the city or province. The VPD recovered the gold in June, but are now turning to the public to help find the owner. Well, here's another something you don't hear very often. Man bites dog. A 32-year-old man is facing charges for allegedly sinking his teeth into a police service dog, Mando. It happened during an early morning arrest, and the suspect was also bitten and treated in hospital. Mando is not badly hurt. Washington State has made some progress in eradicating the Asian giant hornet. The Department of Agriculture has destroyed its first nest of 2021, just 400 meters from the Canadian border east of Blaine. And a warning, these images may be, well, unpleasant. The nest was found in the base of a dead alder tree. It was a little over three kilometers away from a nest that was destroyed last October. 180 hornets were captured. The nest had nearly 1,500 hornets in various stages of development. Asian giant hornets are not native to North America. The prey on honeybees and can destroy a hive in a matter of hours. BC says it is not aware of any sightings to date here. Well, thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. I'm your host, Anita Bath. And if you're not already doing it, you can always watch our program live on our free app, CBC Gem. We're also on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. Well, their premier isn't a big fan of a vaccine passport, and so Doug Ford is being faced with widespread dissent from his health officials. Why they're saying they're prepared to skip the premier's approval next. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. A young Halifax boy is turning his pandemic lockdown hobby into a business. And as Brooklyn Curry reports, he's giving a small piece of the proceeds to a charity that's important to him. When Carter Noseworthy picked up watercolor painting a few months ago, he never dreamed anyone would pay him to do it or that he'd be selling his artwork all over the world. I'm very thankful for it because it's something that I do enjoy and I'm really glad that people are supporting me and that they do like my work. He's since sold originals and prints across the globe, from Canada and the U.S. to Turkey, France and Singapore. It all started as a fun project during Nova Scotia's third pandemic lockdown. He'd been sketching for a while, but wanted to try something new. I was just, one day I went to Michael's just to experiment with watercolor and some of my sketches, and then it slowly came upon to this business that I'm going to pursue for a while. The 12 year old is an aspiring architect, so it's only fitting most of his pieces are of famous buildings. When he first started painting, his subjects were close to home here in Atlantic Canada. The iconic lighthouse at Peggy's Cove, Cabot Tower in St. John's. But then the commission requests started pouring in and Carter had to expand his horizons. The Chateau Frontenac in Quebec City, the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. He's even been commissioned to paint people's childhood homes, like this one in Normandy, France. It made me feel good knowing that they asked me to draw something that they feel connected to, that they like my work that much, that they would like to purchase something that they truly like. But his favorite piece so far? My favorite is probably the Parliament building because the drawing and the painting, I find it goes pretty well together. I didn't do too many details with the windows and with the 
the roof and stuff, but I just like how I arranged it on the page. Creativity runs in the Noseworthy family. Both his parents are artists in their own right, and even they are blown away by their son's talent. I watch him and he's so fast. It's almost like his hand is moving and he doesn't even have to think about it. And what, what looks like a scribble, when it's all put together, there are windows and doors and fine details. I don't know, I think that's just a gift. They're so proud of Carter's work, it skipped the fridge entirely. Instead, his pieces are in frames on full display along the stairs, where they used to hang family photos. The young painter has sold close to 40 original commissions so far and countless prints. He donates a dollar from every sale to Autism Arts, a program through Autism Nova Scotia that helps young people on the spectrum explore self-expression through art. But he'll be taking a break from the business come September so he can focus on starting the eighth grade. Brooklyn Curry, CBC News, Halifax. Many children got back to class today in Montreal's French language schools. That's about 77,000 primary school students. And as Jennifer Yoon explains, the return to class was far from routine. <laughs> on her first day of school, 10-year-old Christy Jean Charles has exams and friends on her mind. I'm feeling good because I got the class I wanted to go in. And I feel kind of stressed because I'm going to sixth grade. Even with all the excitement, the specter of COVID looms large. Students in Montreal are now wearing masks indoors. It's something that the education ministry changed earlier in the week amid concerns about the Delta variant. But some parents are still worried. The only concern is about the uh, vaccination. He's having had a vaccination, but he's not 12 years. So that's what we remain concern. Meanwhile, the education minister was on the ground trying to reassure parents. I think we have a, a secure plan. If uh, the pandemic change, if we have a new wave, maybe uh, public health authorities will send us new recommendations and of course we'll follow them. Roberge says he's open to changing the plan if public health deems it necessary. Classes for English Montreal School Board and Lester B. Pearson School Board will start on Monday. Jennifer Yoon, CBC News, Montreal. And staying in Quebec, 77% of the province's population 12 and older has two doses of a COVID vaccine. Officials used to think that was enough to achieve herd immunity, but now the highly contagious Delta variant is circulating widely. Hospitals are seeing a rise in intensive care admissions, and as Verity Stevenson reports, most of those patients are unvaccinated. You have no vaccine? This man is in his early 50s and he's developed a severe form of the illness. We'll have to change that face mask ventilation for a tube and then we would make you sleep a few days. There may be fewer patients in hospital with COVID-19 than at the height of the pandemic, but cases in the ICU are no less dire and they're on the rise again. Les deux chirurgies majeures annulées pour cet avant-midi, euh, ben c'est les deux patients COVID que j'ai dû monter en fin de nuit. There are now 119 hospitalizations for COVID-19 in the province, nine more than yesterday. 36 of them are in intensive care. Au moment où on se parle, il y en a quatre dans notre clientèle, puis c'était quatre non vaccinés. Yves Campagna was first in line for a vascular surgery this week. He arrived at six in the morning, waited and waited, and by the afternoon, he was told it had to be canceled. C'est doublement décevant. Parce que jusqu'à maintenant, j'imaginais qu'il y avait eu un cas spécial, plus urgent que le mien, qui a fait que j'ai pas pu passer le premier. Mais là, j'apprends que c'est à cause de la COVID. Hospital beds are ready for a fourth wave surge, but with less health care workers than before, those who are working say they're exhausted. On est plus 
Ce pas des livides qui soignent les gens, c'est des soignants. Belmar says it's not beds that take care of patients, it's health care workers, and we can't improvise expertise in intensive care from one day to the next. He says it's hard for staff to understand why some are refusing to get a vaccine. Au nom des libertés individuelles, je roule pas à l'envers dans un one-way, moi. Belmar says they say it's their personal freedom not to get the vaccine, but I don't go in the opposite direction on a one-way street in the name of my personal freedom. The government is hoping more people get their shot before things could get worse. Verity Stevenson, CBC News, Montreal. Over in Ontario, the pressure is mounting for that province to also bring in a proof of vaccination system. As Lorenda Redekop tells us, if there's no provincial mandate brought in, medical health officers say they'll be exploring it at the local level. Some people downtown today seem to like the idea of adding a proof of vaccination certificate. I'd be okay with it. I think I think this is the future. We're, we're heading in that direction where sort of our health passport is going to be attached to us everywhere we go. Businesses, let, let them decide whether they want to let people in for the based on the pass or not. But I think Don't it's a good idea. Don't make it mandatory immediately, but like evolve to that stage. The owners of this restaurant and bar also want something put in place to ensure they can stay open with cases rising. It is... A no-brainer, it's a home run, it needs to happen. The fact that it hasn't happened to this point is frustrating. Today, the mayor of Mississauga had a strong message to the province. The government of Ontario needs to immediately implement a province-wide proof of vaccination program. Peel's medical officer is already looking into creating a local or regional version as a backup. Our preference would be that such a uh, technology be developed at a provincial level. We're asking the Premier to please give this some, some serious consideration. It is coming, whether whatever format it may take, whether it's going to be delivered by the public officers of health or not, it should be delivered by the province. All Ontario's medical officers spoke about the issue yesterday. Some are looking into a regional version. All of us came to a conclusion that you know, it should be a provincial mandate. Um, however, uh, should there be the need for us to do a local one, we, will, we would do so, but we would rather prefer for it to be done uh, provincially. 34 health units doing it individually would be nonsense because there's so much mobility between the health units. A spokesperson for the health ministry recommends people download a PDF of their vaccination receipt. Some say it's not as easy and secure as a QR code. The premier last spoke about this in mid-July. The answer is no. We aren't going to do it. We aren't going to have a split society. Premier, welcome to Big Grass, the First Nation. He's been in northern Ontario tweeting but not addressing this issue. He hasn't held a news conference since July 30th. As case counts continue to rise, we're expecting new projections from the province's science administration advisory table next week, which could add even more pressure on Doug Ford to change his stance. Lorenda Radekop, CBC News, Toronto. On the agenda for the federal election campaign today, senior citizens and gig workers. But one person who's getting a lot of attention isn't even running. The path to a majority government runs right through Quebec. And as David Thurton reports, today its premier listed his demands. Seniors and their issues are always fertile ground for politicians. Justin Trudeau is cultivating that vote, promising a boost to the guaranteed income supplement by up to $500 annually and $750 for couples. Our announcement today is about uh, putting more money in the pockets of the most vulnerable seniors. But it was also a made-for-Quebec announcement on a day when its premier inserted himself into the campaign listing demands more money for health care without conditions. I think we have enough bureaucracy. We don't need to get the civil servants in Ottawa trying to put some rules. And more jurisdiction over immigration. I think it's important to protect French, to, uh, that our nation has more control over uh, the selection of immigrants. The Bloc Québécois responding immediately. All the demands that, has, that have just been presented by the Prime Minister of Quebec are a clear and unequivocal uh, demonstration of the fact that the Bloc is a urgent necessity with more MPs. Back in the nation's capital, the Conservative leader promised support for precarious workers who don't qualify for employment insurance. Gig economy workers shouldn't be left behind when a crisis hits. 
Aaron O'Toole says his plan would require companies to contribute to what he calls a tax-free portable savings account. This is an innovative new benefit for an innovative new part of our economy, the gig economy. Meanwhile, Jagmeet Singh is concerned about Elections Canada suspending on-campus voting. I want to make sure voting is as easy as possible and as many people as possible can vote. And on-campus voting has been shown to be an effective tool. People know their campus, students know where to go, and it, it is a better way to engage more people. Even though there's no on-campus voting, Elections Canada says students can still vote via a special ballot at one of their offices or through the mail. David Thurton, CBC News. Ottawa. Green Party leader Annamie Paul dedicated much of her campaign announcement today to the crisis in Afghanistan. I am asking that we do the right thing, suspend our campaign so that we can all concentrate our attention on where it should be, which is figuring out how we can rescue those that have been left behind in Afghanistan. She called the end of evacuation efforts a national shame. Paul says the situation in Afghanistan was foreseeable and could have been avoided if Canada had responded in a timely manner. Well, many political parties say candidate diversity is high on their agenda this election. Now a new CBC Radio Canada data analysis has found that white men who ran in the past two federal elections got more money from their parties and ran in ridings that were easier to win than those who were not white. CBC's senior data journalist Valerie Ouellette has the story. My suggestion would be we do that, frankly. Vancouver businessman Talib Nur Mohammed is on a mission getting voters to open their doors to a new face. I'm the Liberal candidate in the next election. This is his third time running for federal office. By doing this, you know, you can show that just because you happen to be Muslim or you happen to be brown, that doesn't mean that you can't be an active and engaged participant in the public life of the country. CBC analyzed election data for thousands of past federal candidates. We found that white men ran more often in party strongholds and received more funding from parties than candidates who were racialized or indigenous. In fact, more than 70% of candidates who ran in party strongholds were white men. I've helped young people in our community build a better future. Yafet Tawelde ran for the NDP in 2019. He feels these inequalities are just another way racism plays out in Canada. White candidates are what is an elected official, right? The rest of us are trying to claim our space, right? Are trying to make our voice, are, are making our voices heard, and it is it is an uphill battle. At the party level, three quarters of NDP candidates were white, making it the party with the most diverse nominations. But in the end, most candidates who won were white. The Liberals had fewer candidates who identified as racialized and indigenous, but most of them became MPs. Meanwhile, almost all of the candidates who ran for the Conservatives were white men and women. Just 8% of their elected MPs were diverse candidates. Yafet Tawelde isn't running this time around. He stepped aside, allowing a black woman to be nominated. People are craving for representation. People are really um, making their voices more and more heard. We shared these numbers with all parties and asked them for comments. Most replied that candidate diversity is a priority in 2021, but the NDP went even further. The party has now changed its nomination rules. Every time an incumbent quits, it is now mandatory for them to be replaced by a diverse candidate. Valérie Wallet, CBC News, Toronto. A day of horror in Kabul. Dozens of Afghans clamoring to get onto flights out of the city, killed in suicide blasts, and U.S. soldiers also among the dead. The latest on the crisis and the international reaction, next. I'm Jeremy Rett, and we've met before. I started a journey in the first season of Pieces of the Podcast where I only scratched the surface of what it means to be Indigenous. In the second season, we're expanding the conversation to include other Indigenous voices and their reality learning about identity. Join us on a journey of learning, growing, acceptance, and healing. Listen to season two of Pieces today.
When police reached the site of a small plane crash in the British Columbia wilderness today, they expected to find the bodies of a couple from Vancouver. Instead, they found the two alive. Their plane had gone down in a lake at the north end of Vancouver Island three days ago. But as the saying goes, reports of their death proved to be exaggerated. Here's the CBC's Eve Savory. Just yesterday, a local paper had written that the Johnson children had been orphaned in a plane crash, and now they were in their father's arms. For Brian Johnson, Bugsy, and his wife, Sheila Patterson, had survived what seemed a certain death. How did you get out? Well, the doors popped open, and, and, uh, and uh, then, you're, then it's easy because you're upside down. It was just like a wet exit in a kayak. Yeah. You know? oh, right. <laughs> But to their friends and family, they were dead. The children had been told, the church had been chosen, wildflowers ordered. Sheila Patterson's brother Dennis had written the death notice. I put they were lost. I didn't have the heart to say they were killed, but we put they were lost. And, uh, you know, many of us had, had given up on them. The plane was a 1946 Republic CB, just like this one, an amphibian. A fellow CB owner says, good thing. An acquaintance of mine once lost power and they dove it into the water and it went straight down into the water at about 30 feet and popped back up to the surface. The couple had flown out of a lodge on the west coast of Vancouver Island to sightsee. When they didn't return, search and rescue sent planes in and found debris, an oil slick, Sheila's checkbook. We tried to signal them and we, we, we had tarps, we waved the tarps. And... Burned by aviation gas, that's the mark on his neck, scratched and banged up, the couple swam a good quarter of a mile to shore and walked and walked. Never felt too serious. I mean, we always felt we were not doing too badly. We made a great escape from the plane and we made a terrific, difficult but terrific march down the valley. And... And then police, returning to look for bodies, spotted them. So we have gone from incredible despair and sadness to in absolute elation. So we're, we're sort of speechless. The cake says they're grounded. The couple say they haven't decided yet if they'll fly again. What they will do, they say, is just stay home for a while. It sure beats a goddamn funeral. <laughs> East Avery, CBC News, Vancouver. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Whose responsibility does it fall on to to make sure that the mandated vaccine um, is being checked with all the guests that are attending the wedding? And who's ultimately responsible for taking care of the staffing, taking care of the payments towards uh, funding that staffing? BC's wedding industry is looking for more clarity around the vaccine card coming into play in September. The health ministry says they'll have more answers by September 13th, but that's the day the card is being brought in. Vendors, brides and grooms worry about needing to make changes on such short notice. Caps, fillings, bridges, etc. The seizure of $12,000 worth of stolen dental gold has Vancouver police puzzled. It's not clear where the gold came from uh, or who owns it, but it is believed to be obtained through crime. Anyone with information is asked to come forward. It's a devastating day for a country that's already endured so much suffering. Two suicide bombers and gunmen attacked crowds outside the airport in Kabul. At least 60 Afghans and 13 American service members have been killed. U.S. officials say they believe an ISIS affiliate group in Afghanistan is responsible. And as Carolyn Dunn tells us, Americans say those behind the attack will pay. The casualty count among Afghans mounts by the hour. Hundreds dead and injured in an attack international forces had warned was imminent. 
The suicide bombers, believed to be blending in with the crowds of those trying to get into the airport. After the two deadly explosions, a hail of gunfire for maximum damage. It was a powerful suicide attack, this witness says. Many were killed, including Americans. Along with U.S. soldiers who are dead, more than a dozen injured. We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. U.S. President Joe Biden vowed there will be a response. I've also ordered my commanders to develop operational plans to strike ISIS-K assets, leadership and facilities. This attack is one too many. But the Pentagon revealed there are still credible threats of more attacks from ISIS. So the U.S. is taking the enemy of my enemy is my friend approach, sharing limited intelligence with the Taliban. We share versions of this information with the Taliban so that they can actually do some searching out there for us. And we believe that some attacks have been thwarted by them. For now, the Taliban, an avowed enemy of ISIS, has similar goals. Targeting innocent uh, civilians is an act of terrorism. As soon as uh, the airport situation is figured out and the foreign forces leave, hopefully we will not have such attacks anymore. Playing nice with the Taliban does have conditions. NATO allies continue to demand they commit to giving safe passage to anyone who wishes to leave even after the U.S. evacuation mission officially ends. That's Carolyn Dunn reporting tonight. Canada's evacuation mission ended just hours before the attacks. Officials say Canadian forces managed to airlift more than 3,700 people. But as Stephen D'Souza tells us, many who had been promised a way out are being left behind. They waded through sewage and didn't get out. Now some Afghans who hoped Canada would take them see not just soldiers, but an entire country turning its back on them. I'm feeling very exhausted. We are in a situation, the words cannot describe it. This devastating news came in an email. Evacuation operations from Afghanistan have now ended. At this time, no further evacuation flights are being planned. Among those left behind, Canadian filmmaker Nargis Osman. She says she's lost confidence in the Canadian government. Their actions have really spoken and they're not able to uh, help us out and it's very disheartening uh, as a Canadian. When I get there, disheartening too for this contractor who is trying to stay strong for his family. I'm just keeping myself, acting myself as calm as normal but in my soul I'm not the same person. Adding to his pain, that devastating attack was at the very spot near the airport that days earlier, many like him were told was their path to freedom. I'm telling uh, our Prime Minister, the Canadian Prime Minister, that you didn't done, you didn't done hundred percent. You were busy with your election, or you just ignored us. We stayed in Afghanistan for as long as we could. With the U.S. pulling out in days, Canadian officials said they had no choice. We wish we could have stayed longer and rescued everyone who was so desperate to leave. That we could not is truly heartbreaking. Those remaining now look to the border with Pakistan as one of their few remaining options. There are some, but they are too dangerous, too dangerous to escape from Afghanistan. And just how many are left in this perilous limbo? The government at this point can't say for sure. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Toronto. Kabul may be 10,000 kilometers away from Ottawa, but as David Cochran shows us, the chaos and violence over there is front and center in our federal election campaign. The humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan creating a political crisis in Canada, forcing Justin Trudeau to defend a record that's changing in real time. So where is your personal responsibility for this fiasco? We know how incredibly difficult this moment is because Canadians have been working unbelievably hard to get as many people out as we possibly could. Working hard, but too slowly, says the Conservative leader. Mr. Trudeau has wasted months with inaction and has now put us into an election when the situation has been in chaos. 
As proof, Aaron O'Toole released a letter he wrote to Trudeau on July 22nd, warning, as Afghan interpreters plead for assistance, your government remains silent. But the very next day, July 23rd, the government launched a special immigration program for Afghan interpreters that had been in the works for weeks. The Liberals insist they were on this early, but it wasn't until last week that the first Canadian rescue flight carried people out of Kabul. Canada's efforts did get thousands to safety, but thousands more got left behind. It's sad to say that, that Canada has failed, and Justin Trudeau knew about this problem, knew about the concerns, and didn't act in a timely way. This particular moment is done, and it's heartbreaking to see, but there is much more to do, and Canada will continue to be there uh, for Afghans and the Afghan people. What's missing from all parties are clear answers as to what that looks like. With the U.S. pulling out, there is no realistic military option for Canada. And all parties are refusing to recognize a terrorist organization like the Taliban as a legitimate government, which limits the diplomatic options. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. It was a silver day in Tokyo for the Canadian Paralympic team. A big win in the pool. The highlights are coming up. At 6.44, you're looking at a live shot. Well, you're not really seeing much, but it's Grouse Mountain. Some much-needed rain is falling, but that wet stuff won't last. Amy is back to tell us how long we'll have it for next.
Johanna is off this week, and I guess she picked a not-so-great week <laughs> to be off and enjoy your vacation, Amy. <laughs> no, it sort of depends on the day. Today was definitely a very wet one right across the board, and we saw very cool temperatures. You know, yesterday we got up to about 27 degrees locally, and today we just got around 18, 19. So a big change for everybody, but it is short-lived across the province, in fact. Even though uh, we had quite a lot of active weather, it will be moving forward, and we'll get back into the sunshine for most areas. Slightly cooler temperatures, though, even as we head into the weekend into the weekend. Uh, as you see though, we really saw things uh, drying out at times, so it was all very spotty. It was not a sort of straight system of rain. We will see this next system moving in for Saturday, and that's mainly going to affect affect the uh, north and central coast and the northern half of the province. And once again, we'll see some active weather around Prince George. It was quite active today. In fact, we even saw a few strikes of lightning. Uh, we will continue to monitor the area around Cranbrook for tomorrow. We have a chance of some thunder and lightning and rain around there. So certainly we'll just see how things are. But quite favorable in terms of the wild forest situation as we've seen those cooler temperatures, today's rain, and mild winds. So that is great news for those efforts. We'll see a mix of sun and cloud for Tofino tomorrow. Vancouver Island got all the wet weather quickly and much earlier than us today. So they're done with it already in many areas and they'll get into the sunshine first. We will see many areas though seeing some early morning showers and then brightening up in the second half of the day and sort of further west as you head into the Fraser Valley or further east story we'll see those showers lingering a little bit longer and we'll just see those temperatures in the high teens to low 20s still dealing with quite a bit of rain for prince rupert and prince george Williams Lake, Port Hardy, again, all these areas dealing with the rain uh, more in the first half of the day and then quite unsettled around Cranbrook, but just a high of 18. Taking a look at our five-day forecast, just in time for the weekend, we do get back into the sunshine. So as much as today may have been a shock, it is short-lived. Uh, you can put your heavy cardigan away. So we'll see morning showers and then head into the sunshine. High around 19, could even get into the low to mid-20s in some areas further inland. 22 for a high on Saturday, overnight low down to 13. So we're still seeing those slightly chillier nights and early mornings. And then lots of sunshine with a high of 23 on Monday. We could see some clouds on Monday, but then back into the sunshine on Tuesday. And that's the pattern we're going to see for the next little while. A few days of sun, a couple days of showers as we head closer and closer to fall. We're already there. It feels like it. <laughs> Just today, though. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. You're welcome. More medals for Canadian Paralympians on day two of competition at Tokyo 2020. We took silver in the pool today, and it took a new world record time to keep Canada from the gold. As Devin Heru shows us, that wasn't the only time a Canadian stepped onto the podium. Two medals on day one, two medals on day two for Team Canada here at the Tokyo Paralympics, and it happened at exactly the same venues. And that is the race. Earlier today at the Izu Velodrome, 46-year-old Tristan Chernoff in his second games winning silver in the C1 3000 meter cycling event. It matches exactly what he did five years ago in Rio. He has four medals at the games now. He's going to break the world record, but what time will he post? Glides to the wall and still smashes it by half a second almost. Then over to the Tokyo Aquatic Center. Another magical night in the pool for the Canadians. 24-year-old Nicolas Guy Turbide from Quebec City swimming to silver in the S13 100-meter backstroke event. It's an upgrade from his bronze medal five years ago in Rio. Team Canada now has four medals here at the games. A couple of disappointing losses for the Canadian teams here today. The men's wheelchair basketball team dropping their opener to Spain and in a spirited battle, Canada losing their second wheelchair rugby game to the United States. Tomorrow morning here, all eyes are going to be on Canada versus the host nation Japan in women's wheelchair basketball. Canada looking to pick up their second win. It starts at 9 a.m. local time here, 8 p.m. back home in Canada. Devin Haru, CBC News, Tokyo. A young Belgian aviator is trying to become the youngest woman to fly solo around the world. She's touching down here in Canada, how she was greeted in Montreal, next.
Black lives matter. And all lives matter. Although both statements are logically true, the ideas, feelings, and emotions they create within various people are very different. Some claim that since the phrase Black Lives Matter only focuses on black people, that the phrase is racist. So all lives matter is presented as a much more inclusive term. It says all lives matter. But now, it just doesn't look to me that all lives matter in Canada. So, although logically this is true, the reality just doesn't add up. The Black Lives Matter movement came from centuries of black people being treated as though our lives don't matter. Since there are no biological reasons why black and indigenous people are shot and killed at disproportionate rates, one could conclude that their lives are perceived to be not as valuable as white lives. This is similar to the infamous slogan, separate but equal, which was used to justify segregation in the United States. The argument was that segregation was consistent with the Constitution because the facilities provided were equal. This makes sense logically, but the reality was separate and unequal. In Canada, we use the Indian Act to do the exact same thing to our Indigenous brothers and sisters. Reservations, residential schools, Indian hospitals. So black history in Canada and in North America just does not seem to be consistent with the phrase, all lives matter. A problem with the slogan, all lives matter, is that it confuses logic with reality. Much like all men are created equal, you can't argue against these cliches. Logically, it appeals to our intuitive preference to be inclusive. Which we've all been taught is a good thing and could be a potential solution to racism. Consider, for instance, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It prohibits discrimination based on nine different categories. Race, national origin, ethnic origin, color, religion, sex, age, mental disability, and physical disability. Although this approach has merit, we must be cautious. When reality shows that black, brown, and indigenous people are arrested, imprisoned, shot, and killed at a disproportionate rate, we really cannot fail to deal with these problems because of a misguided allegiance to inclusiveness, right? The Black Lives Matter movement isn't implying that other lives are less valuable, simply that black lives matter too. I'm Amy Bell. Here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Support sustainable agriculture and celebrate local food with Gloria Macarenko at Feast of Fields at Home. Learn more about the Gourmet Harvest Festival at farmfolkcityfolk.ca. And from September 2nd to 5th, enjoy free outdoor performances, a virtual art walk, exhibits and more at the Fort Langley Jazz and Arts Festival. Go to fortlangleyjazzfest.com for more info. A 19-year-old is trying to become the youngest woman to fly around the world solo. She's been making stops in Canada. Zara Rutherford was in Newfoundland earlier this week, and this morning she took off from the Montreal area, bound for the U.S., Mexico, and South America. Rowan Kennedy has the story. Zara Rutherford's pink and white plane touched down on a tarmac at a flight academy in Logueil. Dozens of students were on hand to greet her. The young pilot is unassuming, and so is her single passenger, single engine plane. It's called an ultralight shark, and it was built for her trip. It will bring her to 52 countries and five continents. And she's serving as an inspiration to young girls, like the student body president at LENA, the National School of Aerotechnics. I'm amazed. And I think it's absolutely uh, inspiring for uh, young people, especially young women. And the school's director says it's needed. He says only 10% of his students are women. 
we have less women. So we have to, to show them that it's, it's the start of a career in aerospace and to have a model for uh, all the, the, the young women. Rutherford started training at 15. Should she make it around the world, she'll set a record. Rutherford will be the youngest woman to do it at 19 years old. I can you know, show girls, look, here's, here's a girl flying. You're not alone. You're, there's someone else out there who, who loves the same things that you do. She's off to New York, then Colombia by way of Mexico. She says she's looking forward to South America the most. And she hopes she'll be home by November, having broken a world record and inspired young girls. Rowan Kennedy, CBC News, Longueuil. Great story. You can always find our news program online at cbc.ca. Our next local news is right here at 11 o'clock with Dan Burrett after the National. Thanks so much for watching tonight.